good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Lovely to see you all um, in the room. Hope you're having a, a good conference. Um, we've got a, an interesting session now, uh, a difficult topic to cover. I'm sure you'll appreciate that. Um, the guys with me today have got some difficult stories to tell, but hopefully there's something you can take away from that uh, back to your workplaces and hopefully uh, improve how you're tackling suicide in the workplace. Um, I think uh, it was mentioned before, but there is, of course, a breakout area off the, off the main lobby. If there <coughs> are issues that we cover today that will um, perhaps be triggering or, or you just find difficult and you want a bit of time out. My name's Neil Peters. I work for Samaritans. I'm the strategic program manager for our rail program. Um, we do a range of work with different sectors. Uh, our railway is one of our biggest partnerships. I'll talk a little bit about that um, towards the end of the session. Um, gentlemen, can I perhaps ask you to introduce yourselves? Should we start with David? Sure. So I'm David Hammond. I'm a patent attorney and a partner at the firm Hazeltine Lake Kempner LLP. Um, I guess I'm here because my fellow partner and friend and Graham's son, Jonathan, died by suicide just over two years ago. Hello, everyone. Thank you for coming. Uh, my name's Graham McCartney. Um, I'm the trustee and one of the founders of um, the charity Jonathan's Voice. We were founded um, approximately two years ago um, following the tragic uh, loss of our son, Jonathan, at the age of 35 um, from suicide. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Amandeep and um, I'm actually part of a charity called Doctors in Distress. Um, but I'm just a bloke from Watford, if I'm honest. Um, I actually lost my brother um, a year ago this Wednesday uh, to suicide and uh, he was a doctor in the NHS and I'm sure we'll come on to the topic later of some commonalities between our cases, but uh, that's the reason why I'm here today. Thank you. Um, suicide can be a, a really complex issue. Um, there's rarely an overriding specific reason why someone might go on to take their life. The stories uh, the gentleman will be telling us today will be their stories, the stories about um, the people in their lives that have, have taken their lives. And some of that might have some commonality, but we must be careful that we're not kind of um, showing that those are the only things that can contribute to suicide. So I just wanted to kind of put that out there before, before we go on. Um, and also, and to ask, you know, what were the contributory factors that led to, to the deaths in your lives? Um, Amandine, could we perhaps start with you and, and your brother? Sure. Um, so, so as I said earlier, my brother was, was a doctor in the NHS. He was a, a consultant cardiologist, so really quite well established in his career. Um, and I think things started to go downhill about a year, year and a half before he passed away. Um, obviously, we, we all know that the NHS is quite a, a constrained system and, you know, it, it's, it's seeing a lot of increased capacity at the moment. And I think my brother went through um, really sort of a, a point where he just got burnt out. And as we all know and probably have heard earlier today in the other sessions and future ones, that we know that burnout is a, is a defined phenomenon um, that was put in place by the uh, World Health Organization. So I think what happened was that he, he burnt out and then obviously developed um, a mental illness due to chronic workplace stress. Um, he was working very, very long hours, you know, seven in the morning till eight, nine at night, you know, five, six days a week and, and doing on calls as well. And, and he got to the point where and he just phoned me up randomly one day and said, right, I'm, I'm just done, I can't do this anymore. Um, my life is, you know, as a doctor, is finished. I need to find a new career, et cetera, et cetera. And um, I had a very, very long chat with him. I myself have been through burnout um, a couple of months, actually, before he passed away. So I could really understand what he was going through, and I tried to sort of coach him and tell him that, you know, you've got tunnel vision. Your, your perception of reality and what's going on is very, very skewed at the moment, but, you know, everyone's here to help you. And... It was really only at that point, I think about a week before he passed away, before he raised any concerns to anybody, um, I think with the right vocabulary, to basically say that he couldn't cope with his workload and the expectations that he probably put on himself internally, and I think those of the organisation that he was in was probably a little bit beyond anyone's sustainability to, to maintain going forward. Um, I then went to see him a few days later and had a very brotherly chat as the younger brother, um, that was the first time I've ever had to do something like that for my older brother. Um, and then 
that was the last time I saw him, which was a Sunday. And then um, the next time I, the, the last time I heard from him was two days later. I was copied into an email um, to him and his wife. And, you know, being my brother and, and a typical doctor, very methodical and very logical, just gave a very long list of instructions what to do with probate, life insurance and pensions and picking up prescriptions for his daughter in the pharmacy. And the last line just said, you'll find me at Beachy Head in the car. And, um, and I got the email and ran from work. I was working in West London. I went home and um, drove straight over to where he lived in Kent. And um, when I got there, the police said that, yeah, we're out looking for him. So Coast Guard, dogs, and um, you know, the, the whole shebang, as it were. And, and then an hour later, I think it was about half past eight, he, uh, the police officer came back in the room and, um, and said, look, we've had an update. Um, this is the part of the job I really hate, and we're very, very sorry for your loss. And um, s since that point, I guess up until today, and particularly with, with the first year anniversary coming up this Wednesday, I'm, I'm still in a state of shock as to, as to what's happened. But th th that's very briefly my story. Thank you for sharing that, and it's obviously still a very raw story for you. Um, Graham and David, are you able to sh share what happened to, to Jonathan and what contributed yes, to Yes, um, I think every... Every suicide, it's not just a statistic, and I think we have to remember that. We see a lot of statistics, but actually behind every suicide, there's a family and there are colleagues. Uh, Jonathan's story is, 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 in many respects, very different from the story of Amadeep's brother. Um, I would say that Jonathan's suicide was one of those, and I think there are about 70%, which is an out of the blue event. I had no inkling whatsoever that anything was amiss. Uh, his wife had no inkling that anything was amiss. Um, she went to work on a Monday morning, and she came back and found that he'd taken his own life. Uh, and for me, it was one of those events that turns your life upside down. You take a phone call at 6.30 in the evening from your daughter-in-law, and the last thing you expect is, is to be told that your son has passed away. But I think I felt r trying to rationalize that was not a way forward. Um, there are pieces in the jigsaw that I could look at. But uh, to put it in terms of a jigsaw, there weren't many pieces. And I certainly couldn't fit them together in any meaningful way. And for myself and my family, we felt that the way forward was to form a charity. Um, and that's what we've done, and we've tried to deliver messages to as many people as we can about the importance of, of mental health in the workplace specifically, because Jonathan was a very driven person. Uh, he had a very, um, he was a patent attorney. Um, he loved his job, um, but he put a lot of pressure on himself. And I think, um, for those reasons, he eventually hit a brick wall, and that's the only way I can describe it. He hit a brick wall through which he could see no way through. So for us, the important elements are to reduce the stigma of mental ill health, because I'm sure he had mental ill health, but he felt he couldn't share that. To reduce the stigma of mental ill health, to empower individuals to speak about mental ill health at a very early stage, and to really encourage organizations, which I'm sure all of you represent, to put in place the right policies and practices, real change, not just box ticking, but real change, which will enable staff to talk about their mental health issues. So for me, the important thing is to get the message across that you might have the best employee assistance program in the world, but if people aren't talking about mental ill health and people aren't using your employee assistance program, it's failing. Thank you. Thank, thank you for sharing that. Um, we're going to have a chance to ask some questions from the floor um, a little bit later. So just a reminder that you can go on slido.com um, and use the hashtag TCH19 uh, and we'll try and cover some questions off um, shortly. Uh, Graham and Amandeep, is it the workplace's role um, to prevent suicide? Can we start with you, Amandeep? Um, 
I think it's a two-way street from my perspective and, and the case that you know, I'm very, very close to. I think, I think the first thing that I would say is what, one thing that my brother lacked, and I think indeed all doctors lack, and something that really opened up my eyes is, is what I would call a compassionate work culture. So I think the first thing that workplaces can do is to make sure, you know, obviously, as we've heard, to have the right policies and procedures in place. But fundamentally beyond that, I believe the human element of just having a compassionate culture um, needs to exist. And I think that that's one thing that my brother certainly lacked in his work in environment that I see as endemic or not consistent within the NHS particularly. I don't think anyone ever asked him, certainly from a leadership point of view or even a colleague point of view, how are you? And if we, if we think doctors and indeed nurses and other healthcare professionals, they touch our lives every day in a very, very positive way. But they're in the business of giving compassionate care and helping us. But th I think this equally applies to any sector or any, any work environment that, you know, who's caring for the carers that people look after us. So, you know, I, I certainly think it's that two-way street and, you know, making sure that compassionate culture, for me, for my case particularly, that I'm talking about through my charity, Doctors in Distress, is one of that compassionate culture to start with. Thank you. Graham? Uh, I think maybe David is better placed to answer the role of the workplace. I'll just make one brief comment. I mean, I think the answer is uh, the workplace in my situation can't be held responsible for what happened. Um, the workplace is somewhere where, where Jonathan spent a lot of his time. Um, but I think the workplace culture um, it w w was generally a good and a supportive one, but maybe people needed education. Yeah, I mean, I agree with Amandeep that you have to have that compassionate workplace. You have to, you have to have clear policies that you know encourage people to talk up, speak out. You have to, you have to come from the top. You have to have you know management, line managers, empowering people to talk. And you know, as Graham said, we like to think we had a compassionate workplace. Um, it turns out we didn't. You know, Jonathan didn't feel able to speak up to anybody at his lowest moments. And, you know, it, for me, the only way that I can rationalise it is that it was a perfect storm of circumstances. Um, none of us had any inkling, really, that, you know, Jonathan was struggling to the extent that he was. Um, we knew he was putting a lot of pressure on himself. You know, he was a, a perfectionist. Um, He's a, he was a scientist at heart who liked solutions to problems, so he'd always work to find those. He was incredibly driven professionally as well. So Jonathan fall, well, fell into that demographic of high-performing men in their you know, mid to late 30s, early 40s, um, who maybe you know, didn't know that there was another way out. Um, and you know, as, as fellow partners of the firm, you know, we do look out for each other, and we do say, do you need to go on that trip? Maybe slow it down a bit. But you know, maybe that's a, a failing of a partnership business model where the partners themselves are they're not line managed. And so there needs to be some sort of check and balance in place more than just friendly concern um, to make sure that you know, people are OK. Thank you. Um, we've both talked about um, that work pressure. Are there things that people in the workplace, and also talk about that sort of education piece around um, other staff at work, are there things that we should be looking out for with our colleagues, changes in behaviour, things like that, where perhaps they do need, you do need to check in with them if you, if you notice them? Have you got any thoughts on that, Amandeep? Yeah. So, so one thing I think, um, and again pertinent to my case and experience, that, I mean, you heard the word perfectionism earlier, so my brother had a real fa fascination and obsession with being perfect. So obviously within his work environment, he had to be, um, as all doctors do, because if you get something wrong, then patients die. And I think what one thing that was particularly pertinent was, it was very, he had very much an obsessive nature. And what really happened in the, in the few days before, is, that was noticed by uh, a lot of his nursing colleagues, was that obsession with perfectionism got even more intense. And he was probably in a state of high functioning anxiety. And so an example was that he would constantly go back to the nurses saying things four or five, six times, for example, 
just saying the same things and visibly just being very, very shaken, obsessed with making sure that things were done you know, to the nth degree. It's very, very difficult, I think, to spot the signs of suicide. I don't think there's a textbook answer to this is what you need to look out for. But I think the one message that I'd like to maybe impart to everyone listening to this is I think if you notice a colleague's change in behaviour, however subtle, um, I think, I think what, what I call um, a double tap is to say, look, are you OK? And often people will say, yep, I'm fine. You know, that's not an issue. Just, yeah, that's fine. But I think then a double tap at some point later to say, look, I noticed you're not okay, you know, I just want to have that conversation to make sure that, that everything's okay. So I, I would, certainly for me, I think, you know, the one piece of advice that I would give is watch out for people and colleagues' behaviour, whether that's a peer, a direct line, or even up above. I, I think sometimes we forget that everyone in an organisation is subject to, you know, adverse mental health at various times. So, you know, speaking as a former manager myself, as many people in this room, you know, I would value any one of my team coming to me and saying, look, are you okay? Because, as I said earlier, it's a, it's a compassionate culture, and I think you know very much of that mindset that everyone is in it together is is a very very good nurturing environment to have. I'd agree with that. Um, so, as a result of you know what happened to us, we now have twenty or so mental health first aiders in the firm, and I'm one of them. And part of that training gave you examples of changes in behaviour that you might want to watch out for. So, you know, it might be as simple as, you know, does someone normally have a tidy desk and it's now untidy, or vice versa? You know, d does someone who is usually pristine in their appearance now look slightly dis dishevelled? Are they complaining that they're tired when they never used to? Um, you know, are they, are they withdrawing from social interactions with friends, family, colleagues? Um, so there's, there's a whole host of, I'm not going to call them triggers, but um, behavioural differences that, you know, on their own they may not mean much, they may not point to someone that is feeling suicidal, but it is something that, you know, we can and should be aware of, and if we notice those changes in our colleagues, in our friends, in our family, then it's, it's that double tap, it's, are you okay? It's asking those open questions that empowers someone to feel that they can talk to you. And I think one of the key things as well is don't be frightened to ask someone if they're feeling suicidal. Because a big thing that, you know, there's a stigma around it. You don't want to talk about it because, oh, what happens if I put the idea in their head and then they then go off and do it? Research has shown that, you know, that's not the situation. Um, you're not going to drive someone to suicide by asking them if they're feeling suicidal but it might just be a way to get them to open up. Yeah, and so, so just to add to that, and I think the really important thing is, is to talk to that person. So, you know, far too often I hear certain scenarios where if someone has a concern about somebody, they'll go off and speak to their line manager or occupation or some other function. I think the really important thing when someone is, you know, apparently or going through a bit of a tough time, is reach out to that person first because they may be fearful that if their issues are escalated or talked about in a separate environment, that they will just withdraw even more. And I think, you know, that first point of contact, as you mm -hmm. described, is, is really, really critical. Yeah, and I think it's the double tap as well that Amdi mentioned. So, you know, a few weeks before Jonathan died, you know, I, he came back from a pretty horrendous return trip from the US. And I said, you know, you're OK, you're looking pretty tired. Um, he was like, oh, I'm fine, it's just, you know, I had a long flight and I've got a bit of flu. Then I was not in the office the following week, um, so I didn't have the opportunity to maybe follow up with him again. Um, and during that week, you know, with hindsight, some of our colleagues did notice a change in his behaviour. Um, but, you know, they maybe weren't equipped to have that conversation and get him talking. Um, but it is it's so important to not just ask someone, how's tricks? You're right. It's then following up later and going, actually, I am really worried about you. You know, do you want to go and grab a coffee and talk? Thank you. Um, it's worth saying that you know, if you are worried about someone and you're not exactly sure what to do, there's lots of information out there. I know there's information on Samaritan's website and there's people like Mind and Rethink as well if you want, want to have a look at their, their websites. Um, obviously, you've been talking a bit about the prevention side of things and unfortunately we're hearing stories that suicides do happen. Um, and we know, you know, those that are affected by suicide can be at greater risk themselves. 
what can workplaces do to prepare for a suicide and, and how can they react when one does happen? Perhaps, mm. David, you, you've gone through um, that. Yeah, I, I think, you know, it, it came as a complete shock to us and I, I would say there's no right or wrong way to deal with it. Um, obviously, you need to get the message out to everybody in the business in a, in a caring manner um, but also in a way that means you, you can tell the l largest number of people at any one go. So, you know, we're, we're an organisation that splits across four or five offices. Um, so, you know, the senior management, you know, they devised a plan to announce it within those offices all at the same time. But that doesn't legislate for people not being in the office. You know, you might have people who are off on holiday. I personally was visiting a client. Um, so one of my fellow partners had to call me at the same time as that general announcement was being made to tell me. Now, I don't... It's very hard to say this is what you must do. I think what helped with us was, you know, the immediate few days after that, give people space. Let them come to terms with it how they want. You know, make sure that if they want to just go for a walk or go home for the day, then they can. Um, it's important to just let people know that you're not planning, you're not prescribing how they process this horrific information. Um, by all means, you know, have counsellors on hand. Um, but I'd also make sure that you make it clear to the counsellors and your colleagues what is going to happen in those sessions. So... You know, for us, I think it was about a month after Jonathan died, we had a, a specialist bereavement counsellor for suicide bereavement come into the office, um, and it was presented as, this person's going to talk to you, they're going to explain the range of complex emotions that you might be going through, and let you know that there's support there if you want. So a lot of people went along to that, thinking, well, it's going to be a source of information, that's going to help me process what has happened. Um, but actually, this counsellor went slightly further than that and started going around the room asking people what they were feeling and et cetera, et cetera. And, you know, some people were not ready for that. They didn't think that that was going to happen. Um, some people were certainly not ready to open up about how they were feeling. So while it's important to get that support on hand, just make sure that there's complete transparency about what support has been provided and... You know, as we've heard in lots of earlier sessions, a lot of it is signposting. It's making your colleagues aware of what support there is. And, you know, you can't force someone to go and have counselling or to, you know, go to a suicide bereavement group. But you can encourage them and give them the means and the know-how to go off and do that. And I, think, I think it must depend very much on the size of the organisation. Uh, because some months ago I had a, um, a small startup company come in and, and talk to me and they, they'd had a tragedy in which one of their employees had um, taken their own life. But here you have a company with maybe 15 people um, without a, a well-resourced HR department without really knowing what they should do. So I think planning uh, is very difficult for small organisations and I think it's actually small companies, small businesses um, that are most at risk rather than large organisations who will have the resources to plan, to bring people in. But if you're a small company and you lose one of your staff and there are only 15, I think that's a really difficult position to be in. Thank you. And I'm going to talk a little bit at the end about how Samaritans is working with industry to support them after a suicide. Um, we've had a, a few questions from the floor. We'll try and get through as many of these as we can. Um, we've talked about burnout quite a lot earlier in the plenary this morning and, and today. Um, so the first question is, I have a son who's already put pressure on himself at university. What would be the one thing you'd say to him at this early stage to prevent burnout? Um, I, think, I think it's... <laughs> It's been in an environment where it is okay to talk about um, your mental health issues. So I think it goes back to, it really does go back to putting in place 
wherever anyone is, whether they're in university or college or school um, or in the workplace, that they feel able to discuss their feelings and, and you know, it's, um, it's, it can be so difficult to get that right. And I have a particular concern, which was highlighted in the Accenture report uh, that you would have heard about earlier, um, about going from college into the workplace or from university into the workplace. And I know some comments were made about the inadequacies of universities, but I, I've spent a career in, in higher education and universities. And believe me, what is now done in universities is a lot better than, than what was done. Um, and universities have put a lot of resources into mental health that may not be um, as good as it could be. Um, but I think there's a real need to deal with early career individuals moving from that university environment to a workplace for a number of reasons. Uh, one being that they may move from an environment where they have friends whom they can talk to, and they don't have that friendship group when they go into work. They may go to a location which is far removed from the parental home, so family support is not there. They may be in a situation, as uh, many professions are, lawyers, patent attorneys, accountants, where they're trying to do a day job and prove themselves, and they're also trying to do professional examinations. So I, I, really, I really worry a great deal about people taking that step from higher education into the workplace. And I think organisations need to plan and educate at that point. And I think educating people is really important. Educating individuals, and I think this is sort of answering that question, educating individuals about um, how to look after their own mental health. I've heard a speaker say, well, you know, when I was three, I was taught to brush my own teeth, but nobody ever taught me about looking after my own mental health and how true that is. So I think it's really important that individuals are taught and educated about looking after their own mental health and taught about the importance of looking after the mental health of their mates and their colleagues. Thank you. I think that probably answers uh, the next question I was going to ask around. <laughs> Sorry. Um, I just thought I'd reiterate the question. Um, so do we have any ideas on what to do if someone doesn't want help? And I think that education piece around helping them understand that they're not well, they do need help, yeah. that it's okay to ask for help um, is really important. Uh, I want to ask just, just one more when we've got time. Um, it's a bit of a trajectory because of the clock, but what, what needs to be done to destigmatise mental health issues so people who experience suicidal thoughts can access help, I think it says. Yeah. We uh, need a few more people to vote for that and bring it <laughs> <laughs> up the screen. Um, so it's, a bit, it's around that destigmatisation of mental health issues, and so people will, will seek help. Um, and do you yeah. want to pick that one up? So, so in that question, I see the word still so much denial that doctors can support. And anyway, so j just really, really quickly, so it's just been brought up. So I, I want to just go back to actually your previous question. So the one that um, the person that's raised a question about their son that puts pressure on himself. I think really, really quickly. Um, I think the, the question needs to be asked is, why has that individual put so much pressure on himself? And I think in my experience, university naturally is a very competitive environment. I think, B, there's expectations from society and from within and certainly with families. So the, the biggest piece of I, I have advice for that parent who's worried about their son is to try and learn from cases like ours and, and indeed so many others as part of this cohort to say, look, you know, if you reach a burnout phase, it's not a huge leap to getting a, a mental illness to then thinking suicidally. So I just want to make sure that parent is reassured because many of us are parents in here and you know, really want to just make sure that right, right level of support is there. And going back to the NHS, so the reason I created my charity, Doctors in Distress, was to really raise the value or, and um, make sure the importance of doctors' own mental health is, is made paramount. I think the, the first steps that I see that need to happen is to basically talk about it. And I think something that I've seen recently, particularly in the past few months, but I know this has gone back a number of years. Ten years ago, no one would even have the thought process that doctors even get ill from a physical perspective, let alone from a mental perspective. And I think that's something that I've seen that's changed recently is the more and more people that talk about it, the more it destigmatizes something. 
Now, I, th I think I was saying earlier that um, sometimes you have to be careful for what you wish for, and I think the danger with that is it becomes the norm. And I think suicide is still, you know, a shocking, a shocking phenom phenomenon, and it, as it should be. But I think that, you know, it's a very, very careful balance between the two of normalising something, talking about something, destigmatizing it, but at the same time accepting that. I'm not a psychologist, I'm not very intelligent, but that's my take on, on that perspective, certainly. But something that I'm passionate about, and the reason I'm here today and, and doing a lot of work that I'm trying to do, is everyone has mental health. It's, it's an obvious thing to say. It's equally as important as physical health. But particularly in the NHS, something that I see that uh, is really lacking from an, as an employer point of view, it doesn't value staff health as well as it should do. And I think that's something that really needs to happen going forward. The rate of suicide in doctors and nurses is about three to five times higher than the normal population. The reason for that, I think, are pretty obvious. They're in very, very high-pressure environments. There's a stigma around speaking up and saying, I cannot cope. And one of the reasons my brother passed away, that he couldn't stand up and say, I cannot cope, is because the expectations on him and a lot of his colleagues were, just suck it up and get on with it. And it's, it's to a point I empathise and understand that, when you have people in, dying in front of you, your attention is focused on them, but hence my point earlier about that compassionate culture, which is something that I'm really championing for and wanting to see in the NHS, because we all need the NHS going forward, and it's an institution that I absolutely love and adore. Thank you. That's really interesting. Um, we're only a few minutes away from lunch, and I just wanted to talk to you a little bit about some of the work that Samaritans have been doing. So um, thank you, gentlemen, for your, for your input. That's been really interesting. If I get to the end of my bit, we might be able to answer one more question at okay. the end. I'm, I'm going to press this green button, and I think we're going to bring up some slides. We are. OK, brilliant. Um, so I was asked to talk a little bit about Samaritan's work following a suicide. I think Samaritan's is well known for our helpline service, the emotional support that we provide to people. Our vision is that fewer people do, do by, uh, die by suicide. But sadly, as we've been talking about, suicides do happen, and Samaritans can be there for individuals and organisations if they do. Um, my role is to head up our work with the rail industry, and we have an extensive programme of suicide prevention work with the railway, um, covering a whole range of things, from training to campaigns to outreach to signposting to Samaritan services. Um, but a big area of that work includes our post-vention work, our, what we call our post-incident support work. And this is where we're able to offer support to uh, railway workers and to witnesses if they do see a suicide. And this involves uh, making Samaritans volunteers available um, in the location where that incident might have happened to talk to people uh, and to signpost to our services to allow that emotional support to happen. Um, we do this work um, in other sectors as well. Um, so we've got a schools programme, um, that not only does with, deals with postvention, but also provides resources to schools around well-being and um, emotional support. And actually, coming back to some of the things we talked about earlier about giving young people those skills uh, to look after themselves in their early years, so that when those difficult life events happen, um, they have those skills to deal with that. Um, but a big part of that work is the postvention work, um, and this is twofold, so it's about providing emotional support to students and to teachers following a tragic event, but also um, giving the school um, the skills and knowledge about how to deal with a suicide in the immediate aftermath. I don't think there's too many teachers that go to school expecting to have to deal with a suicide, so actually expert volunteers coming in and actually telling you um, or advising you how to, to cope with that, how to put a plan in place, um, how to deal with that is communication, something that David was talking about just now around um, how you talk to your colleagues and to the students about suicide um, is really important as well. Um, we've also extended that to, to prisons. You might be aware that we have a listener scheme in prisons whereby we train prisoners to support each other. Um, over the last year or so, we've been developing a postvention model in prisons as well. Um, it's loosely based on our schools programme. So again, we're able to give the listeners the skills to provide emotional support, but we're also giving the prison staff, um, uh, put, helping them put plans in place before a, uh, a suicide happens, but also um, we can go into a prison in the immediate aftermath of suicide and support those organisations 
with um, ensuring they put the best practice in place to support um, the community that's in a prison after a suicide. So with all that experience in place, um, we've been thinking a lot about how we might actually take that out to support other organisations. Um, some of the questions that we've had have been around supporting um, people and staff in the workplace. And we've been thinking about how we might take that model and put it into companies. So if you're interested in finding out how we might be able to support your company, do come and speak to me afterwards. I'm, I'm around during luncheon for the rest of the day. Um, just to talk about that, we haven't come up with a kind of one-size-fits-all model, but we're thinking about how that might work. So if you think that would be really useful for your organisation, do, do come and talk to me about that. Um, I've also got some colleagues in the room. I think they're towards the back on the right-hand side. They're waving. Um, so if you want to find out more about working with Samaritans more generally within your organisation, do, do come and grab us um, in the break. Um, that would be really great. Um, and, yeah, find out more about our work. Um, I've covered how you can help, that was it. Um, and do get, do get in touch um, in other ways with me as well, and I'd be more than happy to put you in touch with the right person at Samaritans to talk through this as well. Amazingly, we've kept on time. We've got four minutes left, so I'm just going to see if there's one more question we, we can grab um, from the Slido. I think this might be for you, Graham. Um, what do you advise to best support families and colleagues who have lost someone to suicide? I think I could have... Um, very little to advise people. I think it's a completely, it's a unique situation. Um, every family, every individual will unfortunately have to deal with it in their own way. It's a horrendous event. Um, but whether you're a brother, a father, a colleague, it's a deep tragedy and it's very, it's just very difficult, incredibly difficult to come to terms with. Um, so I, I don't think I could give a, any single piece of advice whatsoever. For me and for our family, uh, forming a charitable trust, trying to make a difference, coming to an event like this, working with um, David's company, working with other companies in that sector, has made us feel that we're doing something positive. Um, the Accenture report highlights how much positive work needs to be done. Um, if anybody's uh, been up early and watching, I believe I did a half a, se half a minute slot on Sky News um, this morning um, about the Accenture report and about this conference. So if I can do that, that for me is how I feel I'm supporting myself and how I feel I'm um, supporting others. Um, but it's a completely individual... I I just want to add to that. I think um, the best way I can summarise it for me, I think, I think bereavement is, is a kick in the teeth, number one. When someone dies by suicide, to those left behind, it's, it's a double kick in the teeth and, and more so, you know, even more painful. And I think, and I still feel this very openly, is that there's an enormous sense of being alone. And I think when someone dies by suicide, for those that are left behind, there's an enormous sense of loneliness. So I would urge anyone in that scenario to find the right support network, and there are charities like SOBS, um, survivors of um, those breathe by suicide. Well, wh whatever support network you need, just always understand and know that you're not alone. That is the biggest feeling that I would um, say that needs to be managed. And I think once you have that right support network, then your bereavement process can continue. And you know, every process is different, every bereavement behaviour is different, and what is right for you may not be right for someone else, but just do what you think is right to, to bereave by this. And certainly the way that I feel, and people tell me, get over it, you know, you'll deal with it, your, your brother's gone or whatever. To, to me, something like this, it's like an open wound, and it's something that will never, ever heal up, and it's just something that you have to learn to live with, and just find the right mechanisms that work for you that allow you to do that. That's the only advice that I would give an individual. I think for me, it's, you know, it's not a short-term problem. It's not a quick fix. You, know, you need to have that support there in the immediate aftermath of it. But people that are you know, left behind, um, you know, they go through these complex emotions and their own mental health can you know, deteriorate months, you know, a year afterwards. And you need to make sure that those people are still supported 
two months on, six months on, a year on, two years on if needed, because this is something that lives with people for the rest of their lives and it's very easy to kind of look at the, the short-termism of it and say, okay, well, we've given them a counsellor, we've given them access to a counsellor, that's it. No, the, the support from friends, family, colleagues has to go on much longer than that um, because these people may be suffering themselves inside and not talking to you about it. Thank you. I think that's a really nice place to end. So I think the key messages there are um, it's going to be a difficult time, but you're not alone. There's people that have gone through this already. There's a lot of help out there. There's some specialist organisations. There's also... Uh, so Samaritans can obviously provide general emotional support. Um, Amandeep set up the Doctors in Distress organisation, if you want to, to look up that. Uh, and Graham and David were involved in Jonathan's Voice. So do, do look up and find out more information about, about those sessions. Um, we're 25 seconds away from... Oh, over from we're lunch. Over. We're over time. <laughs> we're over time. I think we lunch has already been served. Yeah. <laughs> but do come and speak to us afterwards if, if you'd like to know more about Indeed. the work we're doing. Yeah. Thank you. Thank Thanks. you. Thanks very much.